Our next uh, talk is explaining the Old Testament through design law. Has anybody ever struggled with the Old Testament? Okay. So we're going to show you how to explain the Old Testament through design law. And there's one other, there's a couple of key pieces to understanding the Old Testament. First, the first thing you have to understand is how do you understand God's law? That's the first question. Always the first question, how do you understand God's law? But after you understand God's law, and I will I'll point this out as we go through this talk, you also need to understand what's transpiring. After Adam and Eve sinned, could humankind be saved if Jesus does not come? So in Genesis 3, God says to the serpent, the seed of the woman is going to crush your head and you'll bruise his heel. That is probably the most important text to set the stage for the entire Old Testament. Everything else you're reading in the Old Testament is a battle with Satan working to stop Messiah from coming and God working to keep open avenue and bring forth Messiah to save the planet. You need to understand God's law and you need to understand that battle. And I'm going to unpack that for you as we go through this talk. So, Right after the uh, fall, God says to Adam and Eve, cursed is the ground for your sake. How do we understand that? Well, under the imposed law explanation, and I'm sure most of you somewhere in your Christian experience heard a pastor give the explanation, they broke the rules, and rules require punishment, and so God curses the ground to punish them for their disobedience. It's an example of God punishing. You've never heard that taught somewhere? Okay, yeah, that's imposed law understanding. Break a rule, you got to put a punishment on. Design law, though, understands that the protocols upon which God built life to operate have been broken. Nature now is out of harmony with God's design. Nature is separated from the full presence. The unveiled glory of God is no longer fully flowing on this planet. You get glimpses of it in the book of Daniel when Ancient of Days takes his throne and rivers of fire come out before him and 10,000 times 10,000 stand in this fire or Moses' face when he comes off the mountain is radiant. You get glimpses of this radiance of God or at the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus is again radiating the glory of God. Adam and Eve prior to sin was bathed in it and this planet was enveloped in it. But after the fall, God veiled his, un, his, his glory and this earth was no longer uh, bathed in God's life-sustaining presence. An enemy is sowing seeds of decay according to Jesus in Matthew 13, 38. There is a being of evil intent operating on planet earth disrupting nature's order. And Paul says in Romans 8, 22, that all nature groans under the weight of sin. We have genetic defects now. We have sicknesses. We have um, various anomalies. We have mutations. We have thorns and thistles. We have poisonous herbs. We have birds that have beaks and claws that will tear flesh. We have animals that will hunt and eat other animals. You know, Isaiah tells us in the new earth that's not going to be the way it is. Lions aren't going to have claws and and fangs to tear flesh, they're going to lay down with the lamb and they're going to eat the straw like the ox. Unless you believe in Eden, there was lions killing lambs. I don't think that's the way it was designed. All of that's mutation. All of that's infection. All of that is the, the, the God's creation being weighted down by an antagonistic principle that's distorting and disrupting. Weeds, thorns, thistles, poisonous herbs. Death now infects the planet of life. And so God recognizes this reality. It becomes harder to reap a harvest. And God says, cursed now is the ground because of you. Because of what you've done, the earth is now under a curse. The curse of consequences of being out of harmony with my design and my life-giving presence. God simply diagnoses or pronounces reality. He is not inflicting punishment. Well, what about Genesis 3.16? Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you, God says to Eve after, her, after the fall. 
Under the imposed law model, well, okay, she disobeyed. She deceived her husband, wicked woman that she was. And God used his power to inflict a new order that man will rule over the woman and she will submit to his authority. This is imperial law. This is the infection of self-centeredness. But design law, God is simply describing or diagnosing the natural results when love is displaced and fear and selfishness is written in. And when love is displaced and fear and selfishness now reside in the heart, what's the natural outcome of that? The strong will dominate the weak and the weak will seek to be protected by the strong. And that's what God said. Now that this has happened, and you guys do not love others more than self, you're gonna, your fear is going to lead you to seek protection from him and his insecurities and fear are going to lead him to dominate and control you. And I think the history of the human race has validated that observation and that diagnosis. Why did God sometimes act to put people in the grave? Put people in the grave. We might say, kill, put to death. When you use that language, you have to be very careful. I use the put in the grave language because in the Bible there are two definitions for death. There's a human definition of the word, and that's the definition we give and we've all dealt with when we've gone to a funeral here on earth. We've had a loved one die. Someone has been killed. Someone is dead. It's what we call the cessation of life, where the body dies and we bury it. uh, But God does not actually call that death. That's the human definition. And God does not call that state of being death. The Bible throughout the Old and New Testament alike, and Jesus specifically, calls that condition sleep not death. It's important you get your mind around this. Jesus said about those who believe in him that they will never die. Does that mean that every person who's believed in Jesus hasn't died that death that we call death? There's been millions, billions that believe in him who have died that death. They have died that. We've buried them. Jesus, um, his disciples died that death. All of them. But he said, if you believe in him, you'll never die. So either that terminology is not what God calls death, or else Jesus was not telling the truth. It's not what God calls death. He calls it asleep. Further, when he was confronted by the Pharisees with their trick question, remember the trick question? Hey, we had a brother. We had a man who married a woman and died without any kids, and then his brother married, and then all the way down to the seven, and all seven died, no kids. Who's, whose wife is she going to be in heaven? Remember the trick question? Because they, they knew there was no resurrection. And Jesus said, you don't even know what you're asking. In heaven, there'll be neither marriage nor giving in marriage. It'll be like the angels. And he said, if you read your scriptures, you would know better. God is the God of, God said to, uh, that I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and and Jacob. In other words, I am, active, present tense, living, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they're not dead. I'm the God of the living, and Jesus says I'm the God of the living, not the God of the dead. Jesus said it. So there's this death term that we call death. Jesus doesn't call it that. The Bible doesn't call it that. They call it a sleep. And then there's the death that's referred to in, in Revelation chapter 20 called the second death. And that's the death which is the wages of sin. And that's the death from which there's no resurrection. A simple way for you to get your mind around this would simply be understanding that humans are tripartite, just like a computer. And when your computer runs out of power, what what state does it go into? It goes into a state of sleep. And that's when your body runs out of power and it crashes and dies your software, your individuality is safe and secure on the heavenly servers in a state of sleep. And that's what what the Bible is saying. So why did God, so we understand that, then you can differentiate this idea of why did God sometimes put people in the grave? 
he is not actually killing in the divine definition of the sense, bringing an end or a cessation to their existence. He is actually pulling the power and putting them in a state of suspended animation. He's putting them to sleep. Under the imposed law model, God was punishing people for the disobedience and sin in Old Testament times. Under the design model, we understand a larger reality. And this is that what I was saying a moment ago. As soon as man sinned, Genesis 3, the seed of the woman is coming to crush the serpent's head. The Messiah was promised. Satan, did he go on vacation or did he get busy trying to stop the plan? And what strategy could Satan use? If it works, he can actually prevent Jesus from coming. Would God have baby Jesus born to a woman like Jezebel? Would he force a woman against her will to be the mother of Jesus? No. So, if he can get every human heart on planet Earth to harden against God, he shuts down the avenue through whom the Savior comes and the human race is lost. At one time in human history, Genesis chapter 6, it says that the earth was filled with violence and wickedness and violence and wickedness all the time. And according to Genesis 6, there was only one righteous man and his family left on the earth. All other people unwilling to work with God at this point. The avenue for Messiah is almost shut. If Satan can just get rid of this one guy and his family, he has won. Human race is lost. And God acts. And what does God do? God acts to punish sin? No, because sin is annihilation, permanent non-existence, death from which there's no resurrection. God acts to keep open avenue for Messiah. He acts, and this is what you will find going back and forth in Old Testament times, over and over again. Further, I think the flood was brought for additional reasons, to stop the spread of sin in the aftermath of the flood. What I mean by spread, the rapid spread to, to, the, to the point that you have a worldwide apostasy with all but one person being opposed to God so rapidly. Why did this happen in the immediate aftermath of the flood? I mean, excuse me, Eden. There's the fall, and in short order, the whole world except one person is an apostasy. What did the flood do? The flood did several interesting things. One, for those who are alive on the earth, it gave them opportunity to reflect, consider, and repent. They had 120 years of preaching by Noah. And then when the rains came, all of their science, all their predictions, all their beliefs are being shattered. Whoa, maybe Noah was right. Oh, oh, maybe. And there's an opportunity as long as there's life for them to repent. Just consider the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross is dying from a terrible condition, suffering and agony, but he repented. And while his earthly life was over and he had no opportunity to go out and share what he had come to know in Jesus, his eternal life was not over. I don't know whether anybody who didn't get on the ark repented. I only know God, who I serve and, and love, would give them every opportunity to repent. Number one. Number two, this is why I believe God brought the flood. Number two, he was keeping open avenue for Messiah. And number three, after the flood, the earth changed. Prior to the flood, it was very Eden-like. They didn't have to work or do anything to, to sustain or live or provide for themselves. And have you ever heard idle hands of the devil's workshop? Okay. Without any useful labor, human character degraded and corrupted very rapidly. And so as the earth changed... It required them to work to put food on the table, which diminished their opportunity for corrupting their character and the spread of apostasy against God. It slowed the spread of sin. And next reason is shortened human lifespan from 900 years to 120 years. So for those who still apostatize and hearted against God, their capacity to destroy their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, and how many generations down can a 900-year-old person affect? And so God shortened the lifespan to, in grace, slow the corruption of human character and keep open the avenue for Messiah. Why did God sometimes act about people in the grave? Well, after humanity sinned, it could not be saved without Jesus. And at the time of the flood, there was only one righteous man, and God waited to the last possible moment. One family left, and he acts in grace to keep open the avenue for Messiah. It's an act of mercy and redemption, not punishment for sin. 
How do you understand Bible stories? When you see the various stories of the Bible, do you see them as independent, standalone stories? Or do you see that the Bible has one story? One controversy. It began in heaven. It spread to earth. It's continuing through the history of earth. And it will one day come to a conclusion at the end of time. But it's the one story between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. And all of these stories work together to to inform us of the larger story, the grander story, the true story of our Savior. Every one of them leads us to a greater knowledge if we put the pieces together to see the larger picture. Do you integrate these stories to see the larger picture? Ancient Israel, I believe the Bible, here's another element to understanding Old Testament. A design law, a battle between good and evil being worked out. And then ancient Israel, I believe real historic people who did real historic things that are accurately recorded in the Bible. But they were recorded, think about this, there were millions of people who lived but only a very few lives are recorded in Scripture. Do you believe the God that you serve has the ability to, looking through all those millions of lives, select the lives that he once recorded in such a way that they're not only historically accurate, they really did those things, but they also have the ability to teach us a bigger lesson, bigger pieces of the puzzle we can see worked out. And the Bible tells us that these were done as an example and written down as a warning for us on who the fulfillment of the ages come, object lessons. Well, I will tell you one example. There's tons of these. We do this in my class. We do this on our website. But there are seven miracle births recorded in Scripture. These are not virgin births. These were women who had fertility problems, and God healed their fertility problems. They got pregnant in the normal way. But seven miracle births, historically real. I think they happened. But all of them are also teaching a larger lesson. They're object lessons for the coming Messiah. Sarah, she had Isaac. Isaac was the promised child, and he's a metaphor for the promised one, Jesus. Rebecca had Jacob. Jacob overcomes fear, and his name is renamed, his name is renamed Israel, one who with God overcomes, and is the father of a nation built on 12 sons. Jesus was tempted in every way, just like we are, yet without sin, he overcomes and becomes the cornerstone of the church built on the 12 apostles. Rachel had Joseph. He was sold into slavery, but became a ruler to save his people. Jesus did not think equality with God was something to be grasped, but came all the way down to the form of humanity, all the way to the form of a slave, but was exalted to be ruler of the universe. Are you seeing the pattern here? Every one of these, virgin births, metaphor for Christ. Manoah's wife, she gives birth to Samson. Samson's blessed with incredible strength to deliver Israel and rule over them as a judge, and Jesus is blessed with incredible strength to overcome sin and rule over the universe as a righteous judge. Hannah has Samuel, the high priest. Jesus is our heavenly high priest. The Shunammite woman has a child who dies but was resurrected. Jesus died and was resurrected. Elizabeth had John the Baptist, the greatest of all the prophets. Jesus, of course, was the greatest spokesperson for God of all. Do you notice seven real historic figures who did real historic stuff and had real life experiences, but they also teach a larger reality? You will find this over and over and over again in the story of Israel. Another reason why we focus on the children of Abraham and Israel is because of the battle between Christ and Satan over the coming Messiah. After the flood, God chose Abraham, and from Abraham's seed will come the Savior. That's why the Scripture focuses on Abraham's children, not on the Chinese people. And after, it wasn't just Abraham's seed, because it, it wasn't, uh, it, it was, it was uh, Isaac and ended up to Jacob, but we didn't focus on Esau's family, we focused on Jacob's family. And then it wasn't just all 12 of his sons, because 10 of the tribes were evaporated, it was really Judah, because the lion of the tribe of Judah is coming, and that's where we focused our attention. And you notice we drill down, 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 because there's a story being told, there's a real message, there's a real, there's a real larger reality happen, happening, and the Bible is keying us into it, if we're looking for it. 
So ancient Israel, real historic people did real historic things, recorded accurately in scripture, but their lives are examples of a larger story to give us insights into the great controversy. David in the showbread versus Uzzah. Here's another Old Testament story. And this, this real historic figure is teaching real historic things, okay? Sanctuary, when you look at Old Testament Levitical stuff, you have to understand all of its theater. In other words, it's object lesson. It's just acting out a drama. There was nothing in the Levitical law that connoted salvation. There was nothing in Levitical law that was actually required for people to be saved. Do you all know that? Many people think that you had to sacrifice the animals. If you didn't, you couldn't be saved. Hmm. Think about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego during the 70-year captivity. Was there any temple service going on then? They couldn't be saved then. Of course they were being saved. That was only theater. The theater was shut down because it was being misused, so God shut it down for 70 years. Nebuchadnezzar, we have every indication that he was saved. Naaman, um, non-Israelite people, uh, they didn't become part of the system. They didn't act out the theater. They didn't do the rituals. They didn't do the feast days. They didn't do the animal sacrifices, yet they gave their heart to God and they were reborn. All that's theater. Sanctuary is a theater teaching the, teaching the plan of salvation. In that theater, and I'm not going to go through all that today, I've got a whole another lecture that just goes through a bunch of the symbols, but in the theater, the showbread represents Jesus. I am the bread of heaven that has come down, Jesus said. He is the source of life. Thus, sharing, eating the bread as David did with his men is sharing Jesus with people. And if the theater is you're sharing Jesus with people, is that going to result in life or death? life. And so David and his men live. You're sharing Jesus in the theater. That's what the lesson is. And so you get life. But the ark in the theater represents back into unity in God's presence. That's what it represents. We in the theater only come into that presence through Jesus. But Uzzah, reaching out and touching the ark, theatrically said, I'm going into God's presence on my own without Jesus. We can't do that. We can only go into God's presence as Jesus restores in us his righteousness, and it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me, and we become partakers of the divine nature, fitted to be able to stand in God's presence. So theatrically, Uzzah touching the ark says, I'm going in the way I am. And so God, in the theater, put him to sleep. So key learning points. God is creator. His laws are designed protocols upon which life is built. God is working to heal, is, to heal and restore. Satan is working to obstruct and destroy. The Old Testament reveals evidences of God's grace battling Satan in order to bring Jesus and complete the plan of salvation. There are real historical figures who did real historical stuff recorded in Scripture, but they also reveal a larger reality. The Old Testament sanctuary service was ritual. They were theater. They were not requirements for actual healing of the heart. The symbols must be connected to the reality to which they point in order for us to understand that larger reality. So time for roundtable discussion.